so I'd like to introduce myself. My, my name is Loïc Lemer. I'm a blogger. Uh, I created a number of uh, companies, the last one being a, a blogging company in Europe. Um, I was uh, then the head of Six Spot Europe, and I just started another online community called Sismic, but that's not my uh, uh, topic tonight. I'd like to invite you to share, I think, the best format ever of a conversation in Davos. That's the one I prefer, at least, is the dinner conversation. And uh, first, I'd like to uh, say that this is an on-the-record session. So as you can see, there is a camera. It will actually be posted on, uh, on the web. Not everything, because it's an hour and a half that we have together. But it's uh, on the record. And I'd like to thank the World Economic Forum team for that, because usually they don't allow this, so we have an exception. So if anybody is not uh, happy with this, of course, uh, let us know. Who blogs? Can you raise your hand? All right, so how can you do an off the record <laughs> with a room like this? <laughs> so, so I thought it was a, a better idea to put everything on the record. Every table has a question, or every moderator, every discussion leader has a question that they will discuss with you. You're welcome to discuss anything, of course, but we'd love you to come back with a, an answer. And uh, as the starters um, arrive, uh, uh, you, you will be able to start the conversation and report back when the dessert arrives. On, uh, on the uh, answers. And uh, uh, so I'm going to name now the uh, discussion leaders and the uh, different uh, questions that we will address. Of course, this is just a guideline, so you're welcome to address anything. I remind you, the name of the session is Online Communities. Add a friend, accept or decline. And uh, so we'll see if we are all friends here tonight. Let me introduce you briefly the uh, moderator. So we have uh, Fernando Madeira. Uh, Fernando is the uh, CEO of Terra Latin America. Where is Fernando? He's here. Can you stand up? Hello, welcome. All welcome right. <laughs> so Fernando will uh, specifically address with his table how do we integrate brands in online communities. That's one topic that we love an answer for. And uh, the, the, of course, as a table, you can report or, uh, on anything else. But that would be good that we have uh, uh, the answer. Then we'll have um, uh, George Colony, uh, who is the chairman of the board, and uh, George is over there, and the CEO of Forrester Research. Um, and uh, George have, has um, uh, agreed to answer with the table a question which would be, what should large companies do? Um, and George, maybe you can, can you share uh, just uh, maybe now like two minutes uh, introduction? I'm going to start with some boring data and then make some predictions for 2008 about social networks. So here, here, are the, here are the US numbers for percentage of respondents that visit the following websites at least monthly. Just so we all, we're all set here on the popularity of these sites. So YouTube is 32%. MySpace is 28%. Wikipedia is 22%. Then you fall to Facebook at 8%, so a big fall off. And you can see the difference between, between MySpace four times the community size of Facebook, and then LinkedIn at 3%, Friendster at 3%, and Second Life at 1%. And that's a survey of 5,000 US households. Okay, so in the UK, uh, these are, this is UK visits. The three most popular uh, social sites in the UK, MySpace, Bebo, Facebook, France, Skyblog, MySpace, Daily Motion, Spain, MySpace, uh, Windows Live Spaces, MSN Groups, Italy, MySpace, Windows Live Spaces and MS, MSN Groups. Uh, Sweden, Lunastorm, MySpace. Notice MySpace appears in every country in Europe as one of the three most popular social sites. And Netherlands is Heaps, I don't, can't pronounce it, MySpace and CUT. Here, here are the seven predictions for social networks and social computing from Forrester for 2008. Uh, number one. Corporate participation, we believe, this year is going to explode. Uh, number two, um, there is going to be a new title in large companies called community managers. These people are going to be hired in large companies to manage the communities. Uh, number three, there will be a user backlash this year. Uh, this is the beacon phenomenon. Uh, we will see buying clubs this year, which means groups of friends getting together to, to demand special pricing. Uh, let's see. Social search, we believe, is the biggest weapon that, that Facebook has against Google. If you want to go on vacation to Maui and you put vacation to Maui to Google, you will get 400,000 answers. If you put that into Facebook, 
you will get trusted answers back from perhaps 400 friends. And the last thing I'll say, and I'll get off the stage, is that we believe the biggest use of social is something we call social sigma. Everyone knows what six sigma is. That's using process improvement to improve your products. We believe that, that uh, social networks will be used to improve the products of large companies. We call that social sigma. Thank you, George. Uh, then we will have a, a key question, which, uh, which I'd love this table to answer, is what is a friend? With uh, so uh, thousands of friends for some of us in the room, in uh, popular social software like Twitter or, or Facebook, what is a friend? They're not real. They're not real friends, right? <laughs> and there is, a, there is a theory that you can't talk to more than 150 real friends. So let's see uh, uh, what uh, Mitch Kapoor, uh, head of, uh, um, well, you don't really need an introduction, Mitch, but Kapoor Enterprise is one of the main investors, he's not the main investor in Second Life, of course. And um, at this time, so you've, you've combined, I guess, we also have Mark Turrell, who is the co-founder and CEO of uh, Imaginetic, and who is also going to, um, um, to talk about how we change, how we use communities to change the world for the, for the better. Uh, so that's, uh, that's an interesting, uh, interesting one as well. I'd like to ask Dana Boyd, who is a researcher and who knows probably, because we're all too old here, the best the young people, and um, explain us, give us a little uh, introduction as well about social software and especially the young phenomenon. Uh, mostly what I do is I look at how young people are using social network sites and social media more broadly. The key thing to understand about social network sites is they're part of a shift that has happened. A shift in the web that is sort of significant and is part of the web 2.0 culture. Which is a shift in online communities from interest-driven networks, interest-driven spaces, like Usenet or mailing lists or the well, into something that's entirely different. It's about friend-centric spaces. It's about going to the place where your friends are there, and it's you and your friends hanging out, kind of like at a dinner party. For the young people, they've adopted this sort of en masse because they're not there to hang out with strangers. They're going there to hang out with their friends. It's sort of interesting to understand why they're going there to hang out with their friends. By and large, what you see is across the United States, across the UK, into different parts of Europe, and to a lesser degree elsewhere, kids are not able to go and hang out in the places that you and I hung out with when we were growing up parks, malls, parking lots, you know, just random places you can bike around with your friends. And there are different forces for which this has occurred. The culture of fear being one of them, the suburbanization, the lack of, you know, uh, public transit in a lot of my country, um, the activity-centered uh, lifestyle of middle and upper class teens as they go from morning to night in highly structured activities. And all they want is to desperately hang out with their friends. So what they're doing in many of these sites is creating another kind of public, a space where they can go and they can gather, and they can do all the things that you can imagine that teens do when they hang out with their broader peer group. They, you know, jockey for status. They go back and forth about talking about their moms and their, their, their schools or complaining. They flirt. They gossip. You know, all this kind of stuff that you, you know, especially as parents, you sit there going, oh. Right? But they're actually really critical processes because this is how we understand social life and how we come into social life. And yet these public spaces are vastly different than the kinds of spaces I talk about offline. These mediated spaces are different. And four key properties or reasons why they're different. Persistence. What you put up there st sticks around for a long, long time. This means a lot of it's visible to your future employers and all sorts of people you never expected. Um, searchability. My mother would have dreamed of the ability to stream grep or find into the ether and magically figure out where I was. She couldn't. I'm very thankful for this. Um, today's teens are extremely searchable. They're searchable by all sorts of people who hold power over them, people that they're trying to avoid. Replicability, you can copy and paste a conversation from one place to another and you don't know the original and the, and the copy. This is one of the tactics of bullying, but it's also one of the ways in which information flows. Finally, there's invisible audiences. When I'm speaking here amongst you, I have a sense of whether or not you're following me. This is the idea of nodding. That over there, I have no idea who's at the other end of that. That is an invisible audience. And so in my head, I have to imagine who that audience is. And I have to imagine the context, right? I can imagine in this room that we all understand this thing called Facebook or MySpace exists. But do the people there? I don't know. And so for teenagers, they're faced with this space of imagined audiences. And this is where the idea of friend becomes critical. The friend is not necessarily the closest and dearest. The friend is the imagination of who that audience is. The imagined context and what you expect to say. 
So when I see teenagers with multi-generational friend networks, I know they're expecting their parents to be paying attention. When I see teenagers and their entire friend network consists of 16-year-olds from their school, I know they have no clue who else is paying attention. And so part of it is trying to understand how those structures are play. Uh, Jonathan Zitrain, who is a professor of internet governance and regulation. Well, you have to tell us what that is. How do you govern and regulate the internet? Um, and uh, young global leader. And Jonathan is going. Has written a book. Uh, thank you. Yes, uh, I have written a book. The uh, title is "The Future of the Internet and How to Stop It." And um, <laughs> I was thought I would do a responsive reading from the book, but I was told there was not time. So uh, being an academic uh, and trying to uh, initiate the anxiety side of things, since that is my assigned role tonight, I thought I would give you four statistics. Statistic uh, number one is the number 22. The number 22 is how old the very gorgeous person on MySpace who just tried to friend you is. I want to warn you that that, in fact, is not a gorgeous 22-year-old who likes long walks on the beach, but instead a robot programmed by a cynical underworld uh, crime figure who is out to steal your personal information. The next statistic is 4 billion. That's the number of photos that Facebook soon expects to have, which is far more than Flickr or other photo aggregating sites. These are photos submitted primarily by drunken teenagers of last night's exploits, but I wouldn't be surprised if a few from tonight showed up and here, which is why you need to be on Facebook so you can deny everything. <laughs> we have some, uh, uh, someone here actually doubles from a company called Polar Rose. They do automatic image recognition. So if you are just in the background of the photo, you will be automatically tagged and labeled, and um, there goes your privacy. The uh, third statistic is one. That is the number of large purple dinosaurs wearing a moo moo that you are likely to encounter in Second Life. If you do encounter such a dinosaur, do not interact with it. It is, in fact, um, an Interpol agent trying to entrap you into propositioning a reptile. The next number is uh, 3.4. That is the friendliness rating that you are likely to get if you should sign up for SciWorld, the 18th most popular website in the world, and a highly popular virtual community where you rent your clothing and your other items to decorate your room, and if you should fall behind on your payments, everything disappears. People keep an eye on their friendliness rating the way we might watch a stock ticker, and if it plummets, they start madly giving acorns to everyone because that is the currency of the realm convertible into dollars, and I'm sad to say that as of today, an acorn is worth more than a dollar. So um, that's my brief attempt to instill some anxiety into your evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we have uh, then Gerard Florin, who is the, uh, uh, Gerard, the head of uh, Electronic Arts. Can you stand up, Gerard? So this is Gerard, uh, and so we're going to, of course, discuss and expect more from you around online gaming and how uh, they are specific. And uh, just two more. We have uh, um, Don Tapscott, uh, Don, who is uh, the CEO of New Paradigm Learning and who's also written a book, which I have here. Uh, Wikinomics, where's Don? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Don, sorry. And uh, Don is going to share with us a few, uh, a few thoughts uh, on why we shouldn't talk about social software. When I called him about the, when we exchanged about the session, he told me we should go beyond this. That shouldn't be the topic. Just in a few minutes, Don. Okay. Uh, well, let me begin by congratulating each of you personally for having been selected a year ago by time as the person of the year. Thank you. Uh, I know. Give yourself a big round of applause. Um, and it's true, of course, that social networking has and continues to explode. But to me, that's also 2006, basically. Because what's happening now is that this is no longer about hooking up online, creating a gardening community, or putting a video onto YouTube. This is becoming a new mode of production. And the new web, or so-called Web 2.0, is beginning to change, fundamentally, the way that we orchestrate capability in society, the way that we innovate. Ergo, the theme of this, Davos, collaborative innovation, is changing the way that companies build products and services and engage with the rest of the world. So if you can create an encyclopedia with a million people, and it's ten times bigger than Britannica, but the quality is just as good, according to the big study that's been done, what else could you create? Could you create software? 
Well, the Linux operating system is the dominant operating system in the world for medium and large <coughs> computers, and it has some big customers like China. <laughs> Could you create software applications? There's 150,000 open source application projects underway today. These are online communities. Could you create a mutual fund? It's called Marketocracy. Could you create a bank? It's called Zopa.com. Could you create a physical good like a motorcycle? Well, the Chinese motorcycle industry is essentially an open source motorcycle. So Procter & Gamble is trying to find a new molecule that will take red wine off a shirt. You do the math. They have 9,000 chemists inside their boundaries, and they have a million and a half outside that they can now get to. And sure enough, there's a retired chemist in, uh, in Zurich, or a grad student in Taipei comes up with a molecule. They pay him a couple hundred thousand dollars, and Tide has a, or, or Procter Gamble has a new product called Tide to Go. Half of all of PNG's innovations now come from outside the company because they can tap into these online communities and pools of labor. So where is this going to go, and what does it mean for the nature of the corporation, and for that matter, other institutions in society? Thank you, Don. I just wanted to briefly go to a conversation because I see Yossi wants to, uh, to speak as well and uh, all everybody in the room. So last is Reid Hoffman, uh, founder of LinkedIn. And um, Reid is going to see with his table more like how we, we, is there any value in this? How do we not lose our time? What do we get out of it? And is it worth it? So I'll try to be brief so we can get to the conversations at the table, but one of the things that everyone's familiar with is the use of social networking as variants of communication or entertainment, uh, sending out pictures, um, getting bitten by werewolves, uh, playing stragglers, etc. Um, the other side, which echoes, there's a lot of themes in what uh, Tascott said, is that actually you can use these for uh, efficient, productive mechanisms. And it's everything from the fact that everyone, in fact, is going to have an individual brand. Uh, you're going to be searchable by Google. The data is going to be out there. And what do you want to have in your brand? Mm -hmm. To, in fact, how do you want to be productive? And um, I don't have uh, permission to go into details on this, but to give you an example, the, Look at the day before I flew out here, here, we found that, that a hedge fund manager had found experts on uh, LinkedIn that allowed him to parlay $50 million and $300 million in 18 months. Um, and we were like, hmm. Can we use your name, please? No, we don't have one yet. So, Did you get a piece of that? Uh, that's the next thing you can put on the business model. So um, with that, I think we should probably get to the individual discussions. Absolutely. So let's get back uh, with the desserts. Thank you for all your discussion leaders. And uh, so everybody is welcome to speak, of course, now and after. We will just ask the discussion leaders to, uh, to report. Thank you. By this table already. I thought I was the only one to get cold girls advertising in my Facebook. Does anybody get any cold girls advertising? It's just you. Like hot girls and you know. No? Nobody. Right? Yeah, you do? Alex? So I, I thought I was the only one. I, I was really. You do, you see? I want to make a confession. I posted the uh, thing on your Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I was really wondering about my own you know, use and habits of social software and Facebook until I saw Geraldine this morning, my wife, who is sitting over there, who had like a cold girl advertising as well, like hot girls in whatever, I don't know, Zurich. All right, so we're here to give you some anxieties. We started off in a kind of lazy way. We opened with too many friends. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the call girl now? <laughs> um, we started off with uh, too many friend requests. Our cups runneth over. And uh, at least some of our cups runneth over, like Josh Spear, who gets friended all the time. He wants it to be known. Please don't friend him unless you actually know him, because this is creating etiquette problems for all of us as to how to let people down easy. Um, but we're confident that this can be solved through Eventually. But we all had dinner with him, so we all know him. <laughs> we, may have, yeah, I'm we may have shamed him into being our friend now, but we're also confident that this can be solved through technologies and the various social networks, so you can have faux friends 
and accept their friendship, but it actually doesn't let them see everything about you, kind of the limited friend or the frenemy category. Um, <laughs> another uh, uh, anxiety we have could fall under the rubric more generally of data is power. And in that sense, you might build up an entire social network and all sorts of data and photos, and then get kicked off for some reason or another. Uh, maybe even somebody in this room has a story about that. And once you're kicked off, that's it. The plug is pulled and everything evaporates. And uh, that could be a real worry, especially if you feel you were kicked off unjustly and it doesn't have uh, much solace. It was, it was just in my case. Uh, Robert Scoble is now confessing to having been kicked off for Facebook, and later he can tell you why. <laughs> well, why don't we ask you now? Yeah, let's do a break. Why, you, why were you? I, I ran some scripts from uh, Plaxo that so, so explain, because not everybody, you know, nobody knows you very yeah. well. So I have 5,000 friends in Facebook, but that's not why I got kicked off. Um, I, I got kicked off because Plax at one of these developer conferences, I said, well, uh, developers who want to test their software, give me a call, because most, most developers actually only have about 100 friends. And uh, what I found is most Facebook apps, most Facebook apps. They need this dollar more than I do. Yeah. <laughs> most, most Facebook apps break, break down over a thousand friends. A lot, of, a lot of Facebook apps that I try don't work for me because they don't, they don't work for pe people who have more than a thousand people. See, network. this is really a problem. Too many friends. <laughs> it's a total problem. So I offered to the developer community, use my account to test your software before you release it and make sure it works with a, a 5,000 friend account. So uh, Plaxo, Plaxo was a company that took me up on this and they, they have not released the software but they, they wanted to release a software that would let you take your, na your friends' names, email addresses, and um, birthdays. Okay, and take those off into Plaxo or take them into other systems like Gmail or Outlook. And I wanted to get them into Outlook. So I thought this was a, a really interesting idea. One thing that's really interesting is Facebook, when you first started up, what, is, what does it ask you to do? It asks you to sign on to Gmail and suck all, suck all of your, your email Facebook. and friends information out of Gmail and put it into Facebook. Well, Facebook does not allow you to do, go the other way. It does not allow you to put your friends information out of Facebook and put it back into Gmail. <laughs> so they like to suck data in, but not... So Facebook is evil. Um, so, and the, also in the data is power category, we heard the story of a number of Burmese refugees who, as uh, they were fleeing, started blogging and sharing their experiences, yeah. and that was great, you after? until um, a great number of them were arrested with the authorities having a convenient way to track down who the dissidents were uh, among them. So that's uh, very much an anxiety-inducing uh, story, a cautionary tale. Um, a third category is parents and kids. Lots of anxiety about parents and kids on these things, uh, including the parents' parochial anxiety of how do you get to watch your kid's account if they uh, reject you as a friend. And there are several suggested approaches for this. One is if you are new to Facebook as a parent, come up with a number of friends first before you make your approach. Then you're just casually friending your kid rather than having no friends and spying on them. There's also the worry that when you do friend your kid, it turns out you're uh, friending their decoy account and you don't actually know what they're really doing. <laughs> but also a recommendation for those on school boards and otherwise in a position of authority here, not to uh, ban Facebook or other social applications. Better that the kids should learn it in an educational environment and have a chance to share it. And we just didn't like the idea of narcs, moms and dads who volunteer to scan Facebook for the kids, and when they find them in violation of school rules, they send them again to Facebook jail. So um, generational divide there. OK, category number four of five. Four is mobile phones and applications, and understanding that in some places, many more people get their internet access through mobile phones than through standard big wide terminal screens, and hoping that the applications don't leave them out, and also realizing that as the applications go mobile, you can do things like walk into a cafe and ask your social app on your phone, are any of the top 50 friends of my top 50 friends here, and am I likely to like any of them? And the kinds of technologies we use to recommend a book to you or to judge you as a transactor on eBay will be used to judge you as a human being. And we don't know where to take the appeal when it clearly gets it wrong and you're much nicer than it thinks you are. 
Finally, there is a big worry about um, authority. We had journalists and doctors and representatives of same at our table, and they're sad that when people have a problem, they ask Jeeves instead of them, and <laughs> it'll only get worse as they turn to social networks for their um, sources. So we're hoping that we can come up with some data portability so you can take your data out of a network if you want to leave and not have it left behind. Perhaps reputation bankruptcy is in order. You can declare reputation bankruptcy and say you want to start all over again, and this time you'll be nicer. And Loic and has a moment that says he's going to take my microphone, so our table now yields. All right, thank you very much. See what, uh, what happened with Gerard uh, and, and your table. What happened there? It's a, it's a smaller table, less people to... Uh, less comments. Uh, the question was actually, are social networks being uh, needed? Where do they make sense? And Jennifer started off and said she has heard that uh, Davos and the CEOs tried to set up a social network. Does it make sense? And we concluded somehow, no, it doesn't make sense because you need a lot of people in a social network. And if you have just 20 CEOs, I'm not sure whether you need a Facebook social network. So from there we were questioning why does it make sense in, ter in terms of a company, does it make sense to have a social network or to run a social network in a company, maybe to get uh, information flow, make it more free, knowledge network and all that. We had seen that before, so we could not really conclude on that one. Maybe there is some sense if you have 80,000 employees that really makes sense that you have advantages to run a social network to, make, to have a, a company Facebook uh, and allow yourself to hear more what the needs are. Uh, so the next topic we had, is it sustainable? What, what do you have of a social network? Can you make a revenue today? We will see what Facebook does. Is there a business model there in my or in my space? And is it not only today making their money, will they make money tomorrow as well? We couldn't conclude on that completely. We were we doubt whether it's there, whether it's sustainable. In that sense, um, in terms of social networks of games, we think that there is more sustainability in there because it's not only about a adding friends and whether you have 5,000 friends, but you play a game together, you have certain rules, and there are good business models established in online games where you can see companies making money and they will make money tomorrow as well, whereby that money is more driven by today and maybe tomorrow as well by people paying for actually playing against each other or getting items, not so much by the advertising. So the Google model, which works fantastically, we understand that. We cannot see that that would work so good and so well in gaming. Thank you, Gerard. So we have Fernando now. Good job. Michael, you're ready because you, you'll be reporting from the table. First of all, we decided to act as a, a community, an um, offline community, obviously, but uh, as a community because you have people from Indonesia to Chile, stop by Switzerland. We learned that uh, as a community, uh, we have uh, different behaviors when you are offline or when you are online. Uh, we put much more uh, our private data uh, online than when you are offline. So we decided to put some pictures of us, of our children online, and you are claiming that the people are stealing our private data uh, on this day. So our colleague here found a, a company that uh, has decided to protect our data when you are um, on an online public uh, uh, scenario. You know, when you are offline, there is no way so somebody can steal your wallet here. Uh, but when you're online, my, my colleague will protect you. Thanks. Michael, can you summarize if anything happened there? <laughs> you, just, you just threw me under the bus. <laughs> I, well, okay, well, first of all, um, Mark Zuckerberg says this at Facebook, which is there's one social network. It's the one we're in right now. And, and they're trying to make Facebook mirror that as much as possible. Now, interestingly, Facebook's messaging system sucks. Their email system is horrible. For anyone that's a regular Facebook user, it's not very useful for a lot of reasons. Yahoo's taking a different a different approach, and they're making the inbox, the email inbox, the center of their of their, of their social networking future. And I made a comment to, to Yossi that it really email and IM is sort of the same thing when it comes to social networking. It's just one person talking to another. But he said something that was interesting to me that I hadn't thought of before. Um, this is great, I can steal your ideas. That human beings um, need 
need companionship. And if you think about, you could be on an airplane uh, sitting next to a friend and not talk to the friend, and the experience is totally different and totally better than if you were on that airplane alone. Or even if the friend is sitting three rows back, it might be a better experience, even if you ever talked to them. And, and it's sort of true, if you think about it. And he also said that we punish people in society by putting them in prison, which sort of separates them from the people that they care about. And if they're really bad, we put them in solitary confinement. And so I think that the future of social networking, which maybe that was our question, I'm not sure, is, is going to have to be thinking about ways in real life that we think about companionship and, and people around us and, and what makes us happy. And, and how to mirror that as much as possible. And I'd say that as popular as Facebook is, and, and regardless of the Forrester stats, Facebook is clearly growing faster than MySpace. Um, and do you think they'll overtake them in the next year? No. Uh, Mitch? I'm going to do something very unusual for me. I'm going to be extremely succinct. <laughs> Our table actually reflected, in my mind, many aspects of social networking uh, for better or for worse. There was a lot of enthusiasm about the ways in which it can actually meaningfully bring people together who otherwise wouldn't be together, and that's a good thing. But at the same time, the experience for me was one of uh, trying to take a drink from a fire hose. It was like my, my mini feed on Facebook. It was being barraged with with, with statement after statement and sentiment after sentiment without it really adding up. And, and this is from a guy with 5,000 friends, but he pointed out that, in fact, um, you can look at what these putative friends do with each other. Uh, on a Facebook, that would include who writes on whose wall. What Facebook actually does, for better or for worse, is to mine that information to make a determination of who your real friends are, and that's the people who are actually more connected with each other as judged by their behavior, and it shapes the feed of information of what you see from other people based on that. So the mere fact that somebody says they're your friend and you accept them is very different than the actuality of, of people connecting. And the conversation started with um, a project that's right now going across the United States, which is an incredible project you should look at, which is about how do you create green collar jobs? This gentleman did an incredible job at actually pushing it through to a green energy bill. So the actual topic here was how do you change the entire world for the better using online communities? We're actually at a pivotal moment where we can honestly change many, many things for the better really quite quickly. In this case of this gentleman here, how can he connect with other people that are trying to also do green collar jobs around the world? At the moment, we have a whole bunch of point solutions and nobody is connecting the dots. So how do you connect the dots? I mean, already right now, we have a whole bunch of people. Nobody told anybody what to say, but there are certain things that have emerged. We have an abundance of wine, drink, apart from this table. Um, and right now, things, thoughts, and everything else emerge, and the internet is like this. The interesting thing with plaques on Facebook is that eventually, you can steal 62,000 names off Facebook and anybody else and create your own social network, and you can do it in two hours, and I'll happily show you, or some anarchist will share it with you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Our topic was collaborative innovation um, and what's the role of online communities in that. We heard everything from um, how the new web can be applied to uh, creating a more secure world, because after all, the bad guys are using this to do acts of horrific uh, uh, evil and to figure out how to blow up a refinery. So uh, we can have Intellipedia and other capabilities like that. We talked about um, online communities is a way of advancing uh, what churches are doing, actually, in social development. There's someone here who's very involved in that. We, uh, we talked about how to advance the interests of uh, uh, children around the world and to uh, create new capabilities and engage young people in education and so on. Uh, what I would like to do, <clears throat> having listened to the conversation, yeah. all right, I'll tell one long story. Then. <laughs> um, well, here's, uh, here's a story. Um, there's a gold mining company based in Toronto called Goldport. And the CEO, I know this guy, his name's Rob McEwen. The reason I know him is because he's my neighbor. He's actually a, a funny guy. I, I met him on the street. We had a cocktail party. He said, yeah, I'm a gold miner. This is my wife. She's a gold digger. And uh, <laughs> fortunately, she's a very competent person and, uh, with a sense of humor. But uh, he took over this gold mining company, and his geologists couldn't tell him where the gold was. 
And after years of giving them more money to get more geological data, they kept coming back and saying, we don't know, so we couldn't go into production, so he was ready to shut the mine down. But he's also a curious guy, and he did a uh, radical thing. He wondered, uh, if my geologists don't know where the gold is, maybe somebody else does. So he took his geological data, he published it on the web, created an online community called Gold Corp Challenge, half a million dollars in prize money for the best team to come up with the best solutions. He got uh, 77 submissions from all around the world. They used techniques that he'd never heard of. And for his half a million dollars in prize money, he found $3.4 billion worth of gold. Wow. And the value of his company went from $90 million to $10 billion. And I can tell you, because he's my neighbor, he's a happy camper. He just bought a new car. <laughs> now he's a billionaire. So the point here is that we have this view of the corporation that the uniquely qualified minds to do things are outside or inside the boundaries of the corporation. Your human capital goes up the elevator every night. But now, because of the new web, capability outside the corporation can now be harnessed. And this is leading to some big changes in the deep structure and the architecture of the corporation. And by the way, Facebook and social networks, I think, can be wonderful within a corporation to get us beyond electronic mail, which the kids I interview tell me is a great technique for sending a thank you letter to your friend's parents, but it's not very useful uh, for, for something else. That we've got blogs, wikis, jams, collaborative filtering, RSS feeds, tags, all kinds of powerful new tools that can get us beyond these primitive things that we use like electronic mail to really change the way that we collaborate. Thank you, Doug. We have uh, next. Next uh, is Reed. What happened here at your table? So we started with a uh, question. Uh, what happened if someone approached you and said, will you be one of my 5,000 friends? Would you accept the client? No, I'm actually kidding. Um, the first thing we talked about, I'm going to try to be quick here. The first thing we talked about is we think there will be actually, uh, while there is kind of one social network we're in, there will be, uh, we actually all participate in multiple social networks. There's networks of your family, there's networks of your friends, there's networks of your colleagues, and there will be some differentiation between this. Um, we um, also looked at, you know, uh, we, we addressed the question of business models. Now, I actually have a, front, a bunch of knowledge about this, and when you actually have uh, billions of page views a day, you can make an advertising business, and uh, you know, LinkedIn, for example, has been profitable for over two years. So the business model question is actually pretty trivial. So um, if you look at Facebook, there are over 10,000 applications on Facebook today. The only ones that matter are the top 20 in terms of the ones that get used. Those include such things for deep professional use. Of course, actually, Robert may use them for these purposes, such as super poke, so you can. Uh, throw a hamburger at somebody, <laughs> or uh, do the equivalent. Uh, Scrabulous for playing Scrabble, poker, um, uh, graffitiing on people's walls next to you, and so forth. So it's not to say that there isn't some overlap in functionality, and some business may not happen in Facebook. The simplest metaphorical way I describe this is, there's reasons you work at the office. You may actually also do some work in your barbecue in your backyard on Sunday, but they're actually different environments, and there's reasons for that. So. Um, we talked a bunch about privacy because we were concerned about the fact that privacy actually has some value, and even though the entire internet's rushing towards complete transparency, is there some way of preserving that value? Um, we didn't really actually come up with an answer on that because we're rushing to it. And we talked about some very interesting topics, including the identity theft, for how do you judge information accuracy when you have millions of sources producing information, including, of course, all the different fake identities. Um, there's, you know, probably two ways at least that that will be addressed. One is objective authorities that we come to trust in some way, or the use of networks to, in order to disambiguate information uh, through pe other people you know and trust. Thank you very much, Reed. So we began with sort of a discussion about how and when the uh, social network sites are used as separate spaces to hang out versus complementary, questions of whether or not you are focused on hanging out with people you know versus meeting new people. We talked about parent-child relationships and some of the challenges about what happens when your parents are on Facebook, um, how you actually have to deal with some of the challenges of power and how this will affect as people move forward. 
Um, we talked about what it means to be in a culture where there's no attention and sort of the constant, constant switching from one place to another and how this is really great. You know, the multitasking generation is fantastic in certain ways, but when you're thinking about sustained practice both for school or for business, this could be kind of problematic. Um, we talked about sort of, uh, you know, how businesses are limiting, you know, access to, to things like Facebook because they don't want their employers, <coughs> employees to actually go and procrastinate, but at the same time are using it for, you know, business models themselves and how to actually balance some of these dynamics. Um, we also talked about some of the ways in which this is going to, you know, the differences between Facebook and MySpace, the difference between some of the other social network sites, and the importance of mobile as we go forward. Um, and I'm giving quick so that I can get everybody out of here. And there was sort of one final thing as we started talking about some of the implications of privacy and this ongoing question of why is it that people put so much data out there? Um, and sort of the question was like, okay, well, they're doing it in their sense of a trusted community. And in many ways, all of you are participating in this game in a totally different way. Take a look at that big packet you just got from the World Economic Forum with everybody's phone number in it, right? And everybody's picture and the details of what they do in their background information, maybe emails and URLs, this is a manual form of a Facebook. And it's a very valuable Facebook. And you've all contributed to it, and yet people are selling it on eBay, right? And this data goes a lot further than you necessarily intended when you gave it to it. So what does it mean that you have a notion of a trusted community? And what happens when just one <coughs> member of that trusted community breaks it? And how do you actually balance this? And in many ways, this is the dilemma that you're seeing a lot of what's emerging, right? The, the power of a feeling of trust. And then what happens when technology, i.e. the paper, or people take it to an entirely different context? And in many ways, that's sort of the lesson that we have to think about is that in some ways, it's not that different than what we experience. It just looks kind of different and funny. And you'll find this session, I'd like to thank Wick Scott here behind the camera that should, uh, and the World Economic Forum for letting us uh, share that on the web. And you'll find this on, I guess, all our blogs uh, soon. Thank you very much.